Welcome back to Van's Reading. Sorry guys, it's been a month. Uh, basically, life happened, shit happened. As you can see, uh, New Year's. Oh boy, yeah, life has just happened. And uh, yeah, I was pretty busy and had my own things to do. But nevertheless, even though it'll be a month, it sucks. But I'll, like I said, I won't, I'm not gonna stop this. This is, this is an ongoing thing. All right. We're on, you know, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Cunningham in Chapter 33, Reversals. You have the task of setting compensation for victims of violent crimes. You consider the case of a man who lost the use of his right arm as a result of a gunshot wound. He was shot when he walked in on, on a robbery occurring in a convenience store in his neighborhood. Two stores were located near the victim's homes, one of which he frequented more regularly than the other. Consider two scenarios. Number one, the burglary happened in the man's regular store. Number two, the man's regular store was closed for a funeral, so he did his shopping in the other store where he was shot. Should the store in which the man was shot make a difference to his compensation? You made your judgment and joint evaluations where you consider two scenarios at the same time and make a comparison. You can apply a rule if you think that the second scenario deserves higher compensation, you should assign it a higher dollar value. There is almost universal agreement on the answer. Compensation should be the same in both situations. The compensation is for the, the crippling injury. So why should the location in which it occurred make any difference? The joint evaluation of two scenarios gave you a chance to examine your moral principles about the facts that are relevant to victim compensation. For most people, <clears throat> location is not one of these factors as in other situations that require an explicit comparison, thinking was slow and system two was involved. The psychologists Dale Miller and Kathy McFarland, who originally designed the two scenarios, presented them to different people for single evaluation. In the between subjects experiments, each participant saw only one scenario and assigned a dollar value to it. They found, as you surely guessed, that the victim was awarded a much larger sum if he was shot in the store. He rarely visited them if he was not shot in his regular store. Poignancy, a close cousin regret, is a counterfactual feeling which is evoked because of thought. If only... He had shopped at his regular store comes readily to mind. The familiar system one mechanism of substitution and intensity matching in, matching translate the strength of the emotional reaction to the story onto a monetary scale, creating a large difference in dollar awards. The comparison of two experiments reveals a sharp contrast. Almost everyone who sees both scenarios together within subject endorses the principle that poignancy is not legitimate consideration. Unfortunately, the principle becomes relevant only when the two scenarios are seen together, and this is not how life usually works. We normally experience life in the between subjects mode, in which contrasting alternatives that might change your mind are absent, and of course what you see is all there is. As a consequence, the beliefs that you endorse when you reflect about morality do not necessarily govern your emotional reactions, and the moral intuitions that come to your mind in different situations are not internally consistent. The discrepancy between single and joint evaluations of the burglary scenario belong to a broad family of reversals of judgment and choice. The first preference reversals were discovered in the early 1970s and many reversals of other kinds were reported over the years. Challenging economics preference, preference reversals have an important place in the history of the conversation between psychologists and economists. The reversals that attracted attention were reported by Sarah Lichtenstein and Paul Slovich, uh, two psychologists who had done their graduate work at the University of Michigan at the same time as Amos. They conducted an experiment on preferences between bets, which I show in slightly simplified version. You were offered a choice between two bets which are to be played on a roulette wheel within 36 sectors. Bet A11 out of 36 to win. $160, 25 over 36 to lose $15, bet B, 35 over 36 to win $40, and 1 over 36 to lose $10. You're asked to choose between a safe bet and a riskier one, an almost certain win of a modest amount or a small chance to win a substantially larger amount and high probability of losing. Safety prevails and B is clearly the more, uh, the more, popular, place, um, the more popular choice. Now consider each bet separately. If you owned that bet, what is the lowest price at which you would sell it? Remember that you're not negotiating with anyone. Your task is to determine the lowest price at which you would truly be willing to give up the bet. Try it. You may find that the price that can be won is salient in this task and that your valuation of what the bet is worth is anchored on the value. 
results support this conjecture and the selling price is higher for bid A than for bid B. This is a preference reversal. People choose B over A, but if they imagine owning only one of them, they set a higher value on A than on B, as in the Bulber the burglary scenario is the preference reversals occur because joint evaluations focuses attention on an aspect of the situation. The fact that bet A is much as that oh god, I'm getting distracted here. Sorry guys. <sighs> the fact that bet A is much less safe than bet B, which was the less salient in single evaluation, the futures that are caused the difference between the judgments of the options in single evaluation, the poignancy of the victim being in the wrong grocery store and the anchoring on the prize are suppressed or irrelevant when the options are evaluated jointly. The emotional reactions of system one on one are much likely uh, to determine single valuations. The comparison that occurs in joint evaluations always involves a more careful and effortless assessment which calls for system two. The preference reversal can be confirmed in within a subject experiment in which subjects set prices on both sets as part of a long list and also choose between them. Uh, participants are unaware of the inconsistency and their reactions when con confronted with it can be entertaining. A 1968 interview of a participant in the experiment conducted by Sarah Lincolnstein is an enduring classic of the field. The experimenter talks a length with a bewildered participant who chooses one bit over another but is then willing uh, to pay money to exchange the item he just chose for the one he just rejected and goes through the cycle repeatedly. Rational econs would surely not be susceptible to preference reversals and the phenomenon was therefore a challenge to a rational agent model and to the economic theory that is built on this model. Give me a second guys. Two seconds. Count one, two. Oh, damn, two. Oh, right here. Uh, so the problem is that, right, hold on, oh, here we go. Uh, the challenge could have been ignored, but it was not. A few years after the preference reversals were reported, two respected economists, David Grether and Charles Plott, published an article in the prestigious American Economic Review in which they reported their own studies of the phenomenon that Lincolnstein or Lichtenstein, or whatever you want to call it, and Slovich had described. This was probably the first finding by experimental psychologists that ever attracted the attention of economists. The introductory paragraph of Greta and Plot's article was unusually dramatic for a scholarly paper and their intent was clear. <clears throat> uh, a body of data and theory has been developing with psychology which should be of interest to eco economists taken at face value. The data are simply inconsistent with preference theory and have broad implications about research priorities within economics. This paper reports the result of a series of experiments designed to discredit the psychologist's work as applied to economics. Greta and Plot listed 13 theories that could explain the original findings and reported carefully designed experiments that tested these theories. One of their hypotheses, which needless to say psychologists found patronizing, was the was that the result were due to the experiment being carried out by psychologists. <laughs> Eventually, only one hypothesis was left standing. The psychologists were right. Greta and Plot acknowledged that this hypothesis is the last satisfactory from the point of view of standard, pref uh, standard preference theory because it allows individual choice to depend on the context in which the choices are made. A clear violation of the current doctrine. You might think that this is a surprising outcome would cause much in anguished soul searching among economists and basic uh, assumption of the theory had been successfully challenged but this is not the way things work in social science including both psychology and economics theoretical beliefs are robust and it takes much more than one embarrassing finding for established theories to be seriously questioned in fact Greta and plots admirably forthright report had little direct effect on the conventions of economists probably including Greta and Plot, it contributed, however, to a greater willingness of the community of economists to take psychological research seriously and thereby greatly advanced the conversation across the boundaries of discipline, of disciplines. Categories, how tall is John? If John, if John is five, tall, uh, five foot tall, uh, your answer will depend on his age. He's very tall if he's six years old, very short if he's 16 years old. So system one, automatically retrieves relevant norm and the meaning of the scale of tallness is adjusted automatically. You're also able to match intensities across categories 
and answer the question, how expensive is a restaurant meal that matches John's height? Your answer will depend on John's age, a much less expensive meal if he's 16 than if he, than he, than if he is 6. John is 6, he is 5 foot tall. Jim is 16, he is 5 foot 1 tall. In single valuations, everyone will agree that John is very tall and Jim is not because they are compared to different norms. If you are asked a directly comparative question, is John as tall as Jim, you will answer that, it is, that he is not. There is no surprise here and little ambiguity in other situations. However, the process by which objects and events recruit their own context of comparison can lead to incoherent choices on serious matters. You should not form the impression that the single and joint evaluations are always inconsistent or that judgments are completely chaotic. Our world is broken into categories for which we have norms such as the six-year-old boys or tables. Judgments <clears throat> and preferences are coherent with categories but potentially incoherent when the objects that are evaluated belong to a different categories. For example, answering the following three questions, which do you like more, apples or peaches? Which do you like more, steak or stew? Steak, steak, steak immediately. Which do you like more, apples or steak? The first and the second question refer to the items that belong to the same category and you know immediately which you like more. Furthermore, you would have recovered the same ranking from single evaluation. How much do you like apples? And how much do you like peaches? Because if apples and peaches both evoke fruits, there will be no preference reversal because different fruits are compared to the same norm and implicitly compared to each other in single as well as in joint evaluation. In contrast to the within category question, there is no stable answer for the comparison of apples and steak. Unlike apples and peaches, apples and steak are not natural substitutes and they do not fill the same need. You sometimes want steak and sometimes an apple, but you rarely say that either one will do just as well as the other. Yeah, so I get it. He's trying to say that we rank, uh, basically rank uh, foods in categories and what are more primary resources. It does make sense. Um, and, you know, small amounts, large amounts, like you're not going to have like a 500 grams of apples compared to a 500 gram steak. And that kind of does make sense. Uh, basically, your mind already categorizes. Okay, we get that. That makes sense. Imagine receiving an email from an organization that you generally trust and requesting a contribution to a cause. Dolphins in many breeding locations are threatened by pollution, which is expected to result in the decline of dolphin population. A special fund supported by private contributions has been set up to provide pollution-free breeding locations for dolphins. What associations did this question evoke? Whether or not you were fully aware of them, ideas and memories of related cause came to your mind. Project Projects intent to preserve endangered species were especially like to be recalled. Evaluation of good bad dimension is an automatic operation of system one. And you formed a crude impression of the ranking of the dolphin among the species that came to mind. The dolphin is much more charming uh, than, say, ferret, snails, or carp. It has highly favorable rank in the set of species to which its potato is compared. That's actually kind of true. Could you imagine? There's a distinction of snails! What? Snails! Snails? Like, okay, like slug snails? Yeah, snails! Where you're like, the dolphins are dying! And you like, see this like baby dolphin. Where your snail is just like, oh man, it's just like slimy. Whereas dolphins are like kind of cute and like, for some reason we think of good where compared to sharks, it's a total different thing where we hate sharks. We're like terrified of them because the way they look. Whereas dolphins are more, you know, cute. Uh, the question you must answer is not whether you like dolphins more than carp. You've been asked to come up with a dollar value. Of course, you may know from the experience of previous solicitation that you'll never respond to requests of this kind for a few minutes. Imagine yourself as someone who does contribute to such appeals. Like many others, difficult questions, the assessment of dollar value can be solved by substitutions and, and intensity matching. The dollar questions is difficult, but an easier question is readily available. Because you like dolphins, you'll probably feel that saving them is a good cause. The next step, which is also automatic, gener generates a dollar number by translating the intensity of your liking of dolphins onto a scale of contributions. You have a sense of your scale of previous contributions to environmental cause, which may differ from the scale of your contributions to politics or the football team of your alma, alma mater. You know what amount would be a very large contribution for you and what amounts are large, modest and small. You also have scales for your attitude to species from the like very much to not at all. You are therefore able to translate your attitude onto a dollar scale, moving automatically from like a lot to fairly large contribution and from there a number of dollars. On another occasion, your approach with different appeal. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, that kind of makes sense. 
you kind of actually like dictate, oh my God, this is how much money, oh my God, this is how much we can afford, this, oh my God, this is how much we can do, or what can I do? Interesting. So you know, you kind of actually create your own self-worth and using your own ego. I think that's what he's trying to say, is that you use your psychological understanding is compare, using categories to compare yourself or compare your your likings to things. That's an interesting thing. And so you would like understand how much money you would put into a dollar value for like a dolphin uh, charity and or a snail charity. Like no one would give any shit about a snail char charity. So interesting that we kind of create our own categories and what is close to obviously our survival rate or our survival instincts. So the, anything at all, and you also kind of categorize yourself com and comparing yourself to <coughs> everyone else, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, that's an interesting way of things because you would perform certain tasks and then also other people would actually judge like that as well against you and themselves. So that's an interesting thing. Farm workers who are exposed to the sun for many hours have a higher rate of skin cancer than the general population. Frequent medical checkups can reduce the risk. A fund will be set up to support medical checkups for threatened groups. And is this an urgent problem? Which category did it evoke as a norm when you assessed urgency? If you automatically categorize the problem as a public health issue, you probably found that the threat of skin cancer is far Farm workers does not rank very high among these issues, or most certainly lower than the rank of dolphins among endangered species. As you translated your impression of the relative importance of skin cancer issue into dollar amount, you might have, you might well have come up with a small contribution that you offered to protect the endearing animal. In experiments, the dolphins attracted somewhat larger contributions and single evaluations than did the farm workers. Next, consider the two causes in joint evaluation, which of the two dolphins or farm workers deserve a larger dollar contribution. Joint evaluation highlights a future that was not noticeable in single evaluations, but is recognized as decisive when detected farmers or human dolphins are not. You knew that, of course, but it was not relevant to the judgment that you made in a single evaluation. The fact that dolphins are not human did not arise because all the issues that were activated in your memory shared that future. The fact that farm workers are human did not come to mind because all public health issues involve humans. The narrow framing of single evaluation allowed dolphins to have a higher intensity score, leading to a higher rate of contributions by intensity matching. Joint evaluation changes the representation of the issue, the human versus animal. Future becomes, no, sorry, what does it say here? Future becomes salient only when two are seen together. In joint evaluation, people show a solid preference for the farm workers and the willingness to contribute substantially more to the welfare than to the protection of likable non-human species. Here again, as in the cases of the bets of, and the burglary and shooting, the judgment made in a single and in joint evaluation will not be consistent. Christopher C. of the University of Chicago has contributed to the following example of preference reversal among many others of the same type. The objects to be evaluated are second-hand music dictionaries. So we have your publication. So you got dictionary B, uh, sorry, dictionary A and dictionary B. Your publication, 1993 uh, for dictionary A and dictionary B is 1993. Number of entries for no dictionary A is 10,000 and the number of entries for dictionary B is 20,000. Condition, like new for dictionary A and cover torn otherwise like new dictionary B. When the dictionaries are presented in a single evaluation, the dictionary A is valued more highly, but of course the preference changes in joint evaluation. The result illustrates C's evaluability hypothesis. The number of entries is given no weight in single evaluation because the numbers are not evaluable on their own. In joint evaluation, in contrast, it is immediately obvious that dictionary, dictionary B is superior on this attribute and also apparent that number of entries is far more important than the conditions of the cover. Okay. It says here, and it's also apparent that the number of entries is far more important than the conditions of the cover. I just revert, so wait, let me just read that again because it is interesting. The number of entries is given no weight in a single evaluation because the numbers are not valuable on their own. Joint evaluation contract is immediately obvious that dictionary is superior on this attribute and is also apparent that the number of entries is far more important than the condition on the cover. 
unjust reversals. There is a good reason to believe that the administration of justice is infected by predictable incoherence in serial domains. The evidence is drawn in a part from the experiment, including studies of mock injuries and in part from our observation of patterns in leg legislation, regulation, and litigation. In one experiment, mock jurors recruited from jury roles in Texas were asked to assess punitive damage in a several civil cases. The cases came in pairs, in each consisting of one claim for physical injury and one for financial loss. The mock jurors just assessed one of the scenarios and that they were shown in the case in which it was paired and were asked to compare the two. The following are, summarized, uh, are summaries of one pair of cases. Case 1. A child suffered moderate burns when his pajamas caught fire as was playing with his matches. The firm that produced the pajamas had not made them adequately fire resistant. Jesus Christ. Who makes pajamas fire resistant? There's a baby on fire. Uh, case 2. The unscrupp unscrupulous dealings of a bank caused another bank a loss of $10 million. Uh, half of the participants judged case one first and single, sorry, half of the participants judged case uh, one first and single evaluation before comparing the two cases in joint evaluation. The sequence was reversed, reversed for the other participants. In single evaluation, the jurors were awarded higher punitive damages to the defaulted bank than to the burned child, presumably, presumably, sorry, because uh, presumably because of the size of the financial loss provided by provided a higher anchor. So let me repeat that sentence for y'all. Um, the sequence was reversed for the other participants uh, in single evaluation. Okay, I'm going to actually read that whole paragraph because that was bad. Okay, <clears throat> case one. So this is the following or summaries of one pair of cases. Case one, a child suffered moderate burns when his pajamas caught fire as was playing with the matches. The firm that produced the pajamas had not made them adequately fire resistant. Case two, the unscrupulous dealings of a bank caused another bank a loss of $10 million. Half the participants judged case one first in single evaluation before comparing the two cases in joint evaluation. The sequence was reversed for the other participants in single evaluation. The jurors awarded high punitive damages to default bank them to the burnt child, presumably because the size of the financial loss provided a higher anchor. Uh, provided a high anchor. When the cases were considered together, however, sympathy for the individual victim prevailed over the anchoring effect, and the jurors and the jurors increased the award to the child to surpass the award to the bank. Averaging over several such pairs of cases, awards to victims of personal injury were more than twice as large in joint than in a single evaluation. The jurors who saw the case of the burnt of the burnt child on its own made an offer that matched the intensity of their feelings. They could not anticipate that the award to the child would appear inadequate in the context of large award to a financial institution. In joint evaluation, the punitive award to the bank remained anchored on the loss it had sustained, but the award to the burnt child increased reflecting the outrage evoked by negligence that causes injury to a child. Uh, as we have seen, rationality is generally served by a broader and more comprehensive frames and joint evaluation is obviously broader than single evaluation. Of course, you should be wary of joint evaluation when someone who controls what you see has vested interest in what you choose. Salespeople quickly learn that manipulation of the context uh, of the context in which customers see a good can profoundly influence preferences. Huh. Except for such cases of deliberate manipulation, there's a presumption that the comparative judgment, which necessarily involves system two, is more likely to be stable than single evaluations, which often reflect the intensity of emotional responses of system one. We would expect that any institution that wish, that wish to elicit thoughtful judgment would seek to provide the judges with a broad context for the assessments of individual cases. I was surprised to learn from case uh, from Cash Sunstein that jurors who are to assess uh, punitive damages are explicitly prohibited from considering other cases. The legal system, contrary to psychological common sense, favors single evaluation. Interesting. In another study of incoherence in the legal system, Sunstein compared the administrative punishments that can be imposed by different U.S. government agencies, including the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and the Environment Protection Agency. He concluded that within categories, penalties seem extremely sensible, at least 
in the sense that the more serious harms are punished more severely for occupational safety and health, for health violations. The large penalties are not off, sorry, the large penalties are for repeated violations, the next largest for violations that are both willful and serious and the least serious for failures to engage in the requisite recording keeping. It should not surprise you, however, the size of penalties varied greatly across agencies in a manner that reflected politics and history more than any global concern for fairness. The fine for a serious violation of regulations concerning worker safety is capped at $7,000, while a violation, violation, violation of the Wild Bird Conversation Act can result in a fine of up to $25,000. What the fuck? The fines are sensible in the context of other penalties set by each agency, but they appear odd when compared to each other. As in other examples in this chapter, you can see the absurdity only when the two cases are viewed together in a broad frame. The system of administrative penalties is coherent within agencies, but incoher incoherent globally. Speaking of reversals, the BT units meant nothing to me until I saw how much air conditioning units varied. Joint evaluation was essential. You say this was an outstanding speech because you compared it to for other speeches. Compared, compared to others, she will still be inferior. It is often the case that when you broaden the frame, you reach more reasonable decisions. When you see cases in isolation, you are likely to be guided by an emotional reaction of System 1. Okay. So it's an interesting thing because... In the context of someone judging something, it depends on the environment. So we will compare the two informations that we have in front of us. And so it would make sense that, like in this case, where they compared like a bird sanctuary, something, I can't remember, it was something about a bird charity or some stuff. Bird Conservation Act as a result of fine. So it's a wild bird conservation act. So like conserving birds. If you ruin that, you would pay $25,000. Whereas if you have a fine for serious violation regulation of concerning worker safety, it was capped at $7,000. What the fuck? It's an interesting thing where I think this actually kind of happens everywhere. Where there's more, and especially in the criminal court systems as well, I've seen that where some some people go to jail longer than for some other th for other worse acts of cr criminal acts and you know what's funny is that like the bible says all oh, sins are equal but in fact they are not like a guy who steals an apple from a fruit shop is not the same as a rapist i mean that's a terrible example but that's the fact like there is scenarios out there where people do some stupid sh shtick and the guy who did something fucked up gets less because of the in context of the environment of where was that you know criminal <clears throat> and who was the judge and maybe the judge had some kind of like motivation in uh, some information you know um, he, you know an emotional response that day where he forced it out or where those you know depending on what courts you go america us uh, england all different south africa whatever australia they all have different type of courts and it depends on what those people saw what type what what kind of judge what uh, what is the rules who you know it's all this coherent information together where it depends how you make people feel it, that, that's i mean that's an interesting thing it was like the only way you know to solve it seems to like to get things on your side to like make things happen for you is it, it, it depends on how you make people feel it seems and i think this is actually i mean listen this is my way i understand what he's trying to say is that like look at the absurdity of things but this is an interesting thing is that we keep on coming to the same fact that Maybe the only thing, the only way to get what you want is by making people feel certain in a certain way. And that might help, I think, everybody in the world, you know. All right, well, that's pretty good advice. Oh, boy, drop the pin. Anyway, um, so, yeah, that's pretty good advice. Is that, is that you, the only way maybe to get thing, uh, things out of your life is probably making people feel in a certain way. 
because people categorize certain things, right? So if they somehow find out a specific sort of information of you and categorize that piece of information into a maybe, maybe a positive side of things and decides that information makes them feel in a certain way, I'm pretty sure you could get what you want out of them, but depending on their reasonability of what you can take from them, right? So they need to feel that it's okay. It's extremely valuable that you take this from them and they have some kind of assurance where, you know, that this, and obviously it should be, you know, like the, that, that exchange should be reasonable. And maybe that person should get some, you know what I mean? Be more, they should be immoral, obviously, not con artists, not, not, not con artists, you know, but I'm saying you shouldn't be a con artist. And what I'm saying is that you should exchange for the, the exact value because that way there won't be any consequences later. Facts. So yeah, anyway, yeah, make people feel good to get what you want out of life. I think that's pretty... I mean that the I mean that came out of the story of the two crime scenarios, which is interesting. But my point is this: is that maybe to get like you, you got to get it. The way you want to get things out of life is probably make people feel in a certain way, and that could be. It depends on what type, who it is, and like you know what you can get for them or what you can make them feel. And then they, you know, add you to their, you know, whole thing, which is an interesting thing because people are tribal, you know, it does make sense where they can see that a lot of people, you know, it would make sense in back in the day because we didn't really have any value of exchange. All it was, was tribal. You get food, you bring, you know, food back home women do this, the, the kids do that, <clears throat> they grow up and then it's, you know, a full cycle, which makes sense is that there is some kind of emotional uh, value being exchanged where you get something out of it. So there is, it's, it's an interesting thing where categories come into place. Anyway, I'll probably be talking about later on in the next chapter, but very interestingly enough that to get what you want out of anybody, you got to make them feel in a certain uh, feel a certain way, and that's so. You just pr and the best way to do that is by presenting information in front of them that allows them to change their perspective and emotional uh, instinct on you, and that will allow them to change. So the mind and the body, you know, the mind and the body receives quite a bit of, you know, information and, you know, we, we get confused like, oh, like, what, what is, I don't know what this means. I don't know what to do to, no, what you do is you got to give them the correct information while well, the not correct, meaning the, the information that allows them to, you know, give them the certain feeling and that will allow them to give them something to this, that will allow them to give them, no, sorry, how do you say it? That will allow them to give you, no, that will allow them to give you whatever they want. So like, they'll give you like something important, something that, that make you, you might need. And I'm just gonna make sure that I rephrase this just one more time. They will give you what you want if you make them feel good. I think that's the best way I can put it. And the better, the, per, the more valuable person in front of you is, the more, most likely the more valuable what you want that you're getting from them. What you're getting from is what you want is going to be extremely more valuable. So I think that's pretty much what I learned from it, from this chapter. Because this is how people, you know, decide. I mean, not decide, but this is how biologically you think. So, yeah. Anyway, that's it. Uh, leave your comments and, you know, sticks and whatever below. And like and subscribe, you know, I, just, I haven't done this for a month, so don't judge me if I've been a little bit shit. Whoops. Uh, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for watching.